This morning's scripture is being read from the message paraphrase of the Bible. Please listen as we hear the passage through fresh words. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. But don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. Now, because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it altogether are in on everything. The Messiah has made things up between us so that now we're together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. Then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people, separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He is using us all, irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. This is the word of the Lord. I learned it in grade one. That was the year that a new girl named Janice arrived in our class. And she began gathering other kids around her. But she was very particular about who was admitted to the inner circle around her. You can probably guess I wasn't among them. Every recess and noontime, her group played together. And if you happened to be on the monkey bars and they arrived, you just knew to move along. One day, Janice decided that it was good to solidify this a little more. And so she got her kids to work all together, and they formed a barrier, a rock barrier boundary around the the hydro pole that was in the middle of our playground. And she said, outsiders are not welcome in here. So they would be verbally or physically harassed if you dared go near. Humans have a propensity for dividing things up. Insiders and outsiders, saints and sinners, rich and poor, black, white, native, non-native, 
male, female, gay, straight, Protestant, Catholic, Christian, Muslim, liberal, conservative, have, have not. It's an ancient problem. We hear of it even in today's letter to the Ephesians. The great divide between Jews and Gentiles. Humans have trouble with difference. And we know how those differences and divisions work, especially when we have been on the opposite side of the line. Right? You know how it unfolds. Sometimes it might just even be an unspoken uh, sense that I'm better than you. Other times, it may be a family clique. It may be separate neighborhoods or even physical dividing walls. And we've done a lot of those, haven't we? The Great Wall of China, Hadrian's Wall, the Berlin Wall, the Israeli-Palestine Wall, or closer to home, Trump's promised wall between the U.S. and Mexico. We have trouble dealing with difference. It's true. And it's not a minor problem. The results are devastating. Whether it's the recent shooting of 11 Jews in a Pittsburgh synagogue, or whether it's the horror of World War I, which ended 100 years ago today at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. 65 million men from 30 countries fought in the First World War. Life expectancy in the trenches, on average, was six months. Six weeks, sorry, six weeks. More than nine million fighting men were killed in the First World War, and one-third of them died through disease. In the Second World War, 55 million people were killed. And wars still rage in the world, in Syria, in South Sudan, in Yemen. Israel and Palestine have been in conflict for 70 years. Here in North America, we also sense this dividedness in our civic life together. We've just been through a recent U.S. election campaign, and hopefully our plebiscite coming up this, this week in Calgary won't prove so divisive. But you know these days that campaigns are less about the issues often and more about fear-mongering, scapegoating, and personal attacks. And even the church is plagued by division, you know that, even in the Presbyterian Church in Canada now, as we discern over issues of, Christ of human sexuality. All of these kinds of divisions and conflicts can certainly discourage us, can make this seem like a chaotic place that we're in, and maybe even convince us that there's little hope or possibility for ever overcoming them. Yet Ephesians offers us radiant hope this day that actually things can change and that things have been changing. Ephesians puts before us what happens when the power of the resurrection is brought to bear on mundane things? Here in, Peter's, in Paul's letter, the church is let in on God's overarching vision and plan for the cosmos to put an end to all dividing walls 
and to bring us all together and gather us up together in Christ. As our reading says, Christ tore down the dividing walls and started over by creating a new kind of human being, a new humanity, a fresh start through the reconciliation of the cross, which is meant to be the end of insiders and outsiders. It is Paul's desire here that the church might both know this more fully and live it more faithfully. You see, in Paul's time, the church was actually on the forefront of breaking down these walls, of pulling down divisions. And so here we hear how that's happening between Jews and Gentiles, but that was only the beginning. The church brought down divisions between people of different races, different, different uh, work backgrounds, different classes, and brought them all together into one. It was radical. But this gives us a picture of the kind of undivided humanity that is promised in Scripture and that God intends to bring. Now, perhaps you're thinking that Paul's getting a little ahead of himself and that the poetry may just soar a little too much here since we know that that the church has also been part of the conflict and division in the world. But think of it. Paul wasn't naive about the divisions in the church. Just read the, the letter to the Corinthians. Lots of messy conflict there. But see, Paul is so convinced that the resurrection power of Jesus at work in the world can do this, can take insiders and outsiders and bring them together into one. As a result of that, St. Andrew's Church, this community of faith, has a role to play in God's desire to save the cosmos because this is to be the place where those divisions melt away into oneness and wholeness. You know what? We may not be called to go to the Jerusalem temple to, to pull down walls and barriers there, but you know that each one of us are called to live this new peaceable difference by crossing the aisle, by crossing a divide of difference and reaching out, even to those we may disagree with. In a deeply divided world, which threatens each day to come apart because of the differences in so many, uh, so many different kinds of differences, it is truly a gospel moment when people with little or nothing in common find common ground together. There we discover the good news of Jesus' cross, which is that our differences don't need to divide us, that love is more important than being right. There we discover God's power to be able to affect such peaceable difference. And we as the church are called to live in the direction of this stunning new thing that God is doing in the world. Jew and Gentile, insider and outsider, people with great differences in one community, together, amazing things can happen. Walls brought down. Now we're going to hear an example of how this has happened not too long ago from Jeremy Hexham, who is our communications guy here at St. Andrews, and he's going to talk about the Berlin Wall, something of considerable passion for him. Thank you. Good morning. 
On Thursday, November 9, 1989, at 6.58 p.m., during a hastily called press conference that was supposed to become a nightly event, an Italian reporter asked Gunter Schabowski, the East German Politburo member and the unofficial spokesperson for the new regime, about tra East German travel regulations. Schabowski fumbled about looking for a piece of paper and then shocked all the reporters in the room when he announced that East German citizens could apply to travel abroad without having to meet the previous restrictive travel requirements. Another reporter asked when this would come into effect, and he answered, well, as far as I know, effective immediately, without delay. Despite the East German government's repeated attempt to prevent it, East Berliners were able to watch West, German, or West Berlin television and the two networks covered the news conference. And the news spread like wildfire. East Berliners started lining up at the border crossings to visit the West. By 8.30, there were a huge crowd at the different crossings, and the guards didn't know what to do. At the Baumhammerstrasse border crossing, the guards were eventually told to let the people pass through but to put a red stamp on their passport that, would meant, that meant they could not return home. But they were not to mention this. By 11.30 p.m., that solution proved very impractical, and the guards had little choice but to open the gate. Over the next 24 hours, the Berlin Wall opened everywhere. What's really remarkable about this story, and what most people do not realize, is that the travel regulation policy had only been approved uh, by the Politburo earlier that day. It was supposed to have been embargoed until the following day and would not come into effect until Christmas. But to understand why this policy came about, we have to go back to 1982 to Leipzig, Germany. At the beginning of September of that year, Pastor Christian Fuhler of the Nikolai Kirka, or St. Nicholas Church, began holding prayer meetings and led discussions every Monday evening at 5 p.m. for people who were turning, returning home from work. These discussions were about world peace and indirectly about the fall of the Berlin Wall, or at least the opening of the wall. The East German security police, the Stasi, did not consider the prayer meetings a threat, so they ignored them. On the seventh anniversary of the founding of the meetings, Monday, September 4th, 1989, a group of participants decided to go for a prayer walk around the old city walls of Leipzig. The prayer walks continued for, the very, for a few weeks, getting very little attention, but the attendance grew slowly. At the same time, the idea of prayer walks began catching on in several other East German cities, including Berlin. Four weeks later, October 2nd, almost every East German city had some sort of Monday evening prayer walk demonstration. Celebrations for the 40th anniversary of the founding of East Germany took place on Saturday, October 7th. They were disrupted by thousands of people protesting outside the Palace of the Republic, that is, the East German Parliament Building. They were crushed by the security police who beat them up, and there were over 500 arrests. The following Monday, October 9th, in Leipzig, over 70,000 people, or just, or ju uh, just under one-sixth of the population, marched in a hu and huge demonstrations took place in every other East German city. After this, the marches became a weekly event. The East German government did everything it could to disrupt the protests. Yet, they gained the momentum and the numbers of participants grew, even though the soldiers were de and police were deployed in full riot gear with machine guns and attack dogs at the ready. There was considerable fear and tension. Remember, Tiananmen Square had only happened a few months earlier and was still fresh in everybody's memory. But nothing happened. 
On October 18th, 11 days after the 40th anniversary celebrations, Eric Honecker, the East German leader, was overthrown and a new regime took over, trying to calm things down. The Monday peaceful demonstrations continued. Then, on November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, without violence and completely unexpectedly. Because the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, other walls fell. In Eastern Europe, communism collapsed. And in South Africa, the wall of segregation, known as apartheid, fell. The Berlin Wall fell 10 weeks after the initial prayer walk in Leipzig. This led the chief of police in Magdeburg, not Leipzig as has been reported, to say, we were prepared for everything except candlelights and prayer. Thank you. <laughs>